I draw on the surface and I scratch the surface and I rub paint into the scratched parts of the surface. I push the surface out so you have all these realms. You have the, it, it exists in the world with you in its three-dimensional quality. And then you hit the plane of the material, which is this beautiful kind of gun metal -y gorgeousness. So you know that it is the material. And then you delve beyond the material with the line quality and the perspective. So you kind of, I have the ability to, to work in the three dimensions, the flat surface of the material, and then to delve beyond that into the mysteriousness of the material. And it is a mysterious material, and it's available. I will do a lot of drawing on the metal, erase it, draw on it, erase it, and draw on it. And the old lines on all the old work that I've done, every time I come to the piece, those remain in the piece. And when I heat it up towards the end of the process, a lot of the old lines uh, come back. And my intentions are pretty firm, but I, I'm never in complete control. I don't like being in complete charge. I, I don't like the work to be dead in the water. I like the work to be, you know, to have a life of its own beyond what I necessarily intended. I grew up in Massachusetts. I went to RISD, where I studied glass. After I graduated from RISD, I went to Mexico. It was in San Miguel de Allende. It was a small craft school, and I lived there for three months. I was going to study ceramics, but the ceramics course was full. So I ended up studying tinsmithing because it was the only open class at the time. And I'd realized it was what I wanted to do, hands down. The metal was, like I said, much more um, of a material that I could manipulate and to my own devices, I guess. I'm fascinated with time. I'm fascinated with trying to focus on the split second. You know, just trying to break it down, break it down, break it down. Just trying to make an observation, any sort of observation, any sort of split second observation. A lot of my work is symbolic. I mean, I, I have to have sort of a vocabulary to try to communicate the inconceivable, like the lightning strike for instance, is for me, the lightning strike is a split second. It's a supercharged, incredibly hot, you know, possibly enormously destructive and deadly split second, but it's a split second. It's, it's, it's a visual marker of time. I use uh, a stylized civil defense siren. It demonstrates how quickly things can change, how something can be completely silent and, and then in the next split second, you know, everything's changed when it's blaring or when it's announcing a tornado or, or whatever. So you'll see a lot of these images in my work that are basically just trying to present the unpresentable. To bring to light your experience of existence, if you will. I'm focusing on the small to, to demonstrate the large. You know, because there is existence in everything. So in, on my own scale, I'm trying to demonstrate that by breaking it down to the second if I can. That's what I was trying to say is that within that second is, is everything, is the hugeness of it all, or possibly the hugeness of it all. Well, I think the origin of the fascination is growing up by the ocean. I spent my entire childhood on the ocean. So on this, where the land meets this massive force you know, you really understand how, how small you are in relation to it. And it's also nice because, you know, like the ocean is one of the few places like the common person can become part of the food chain even. I mean, we're so outside of ourselves and we're so full of ourselves that when you think about, you know, hey, this is a place where I could actually be eaten. <laughs> I wanted to make something that I thought could be beautiful, and I wanted to just make it for the sake of it being beautiful. For instance, the piece I'm working on now, I'm trying to find the beauty in the rabies virus. <laughs> when things move beyond the traditional definition of beauty, it's a fascination for me. The rabies virus it travels up the central nervous system, attacks the portions of the brain that cause violence or tendencies towards violence or insanity. Uh, 
and also salivation, excessive salivation. So they, it migrates to the brain, causing those things to occur, and then migrates to the mouth, where it is then transferred to the next host because it's caused its host to become violent and salivate excessively, which I think is astounding. There's a sublime beauty in it. And I'm combining that with the migration of the monarch butterflies, which is also beautiful in a much more obvious sense. They migrate to um, one strip of land in Mexico, they all do. Then over the course of, I think, four generations, they work their way from Mexico up to Canada, where that generation is born in Canada and knows to fly all the way back to that one strip of land in Mexico. I'm trying to encapsulate those two things, one being really obviously beautiful and the other being a much more different sense of beauty, this virus that controls its host. Beauty is a hard word to define. We're just kicking it down the field for an incredibly short time here as well, when you think of geological history or something. I mean, yet, well, we're here, and when I say we, I mean humans. Well, we're here, we think we have some sort of, like, power. <laughs> we think we have some sort of, we're a member of the hierarchy in some, in some fashion, but we're not. think in terms of, of, say, the grass beneath your feet and the existence of uh, a neutron star. A teaspoon of neutron star mass is a billion tons. I mean, it's inconceivable that something could be so heavy and yet, at the same time, you know, you're lying on the grass. It's just this whole notion of as I said, presenting the, the inconceivable as inconceivable. You know, not trying to explain it because it's inexplicable, but just presenting it as an inconceivable thing. And I think if you were ever to achieve that understanding, then you'd go completely crazy. At least I would, I suspect. I love Providence. Although I love New York a lot, uh, I just found it easier to do artwork here. And it's a beautiful little city. I love it. It's got a great energy. There's something about Rhode Island that's just much softer and much more accepting and much more yielding. It's a weird existence we have. I mean, I spend my day virtually alone, isolated, trying to understand things. I mean, I kind of think of life as a continuous thought, you know, uh, and these are markers along the way. I don't have an answer, and I never will, and that's what's fascinating to me. I'm doing the work to not just inform or to, to dictate, but it's a dialogue with the work, and it's a di the work has a dialogue with the viewer. It needs to be a bigger picture than just a beginning, a middle, and an end, a presentation, and on to the next. And so in real time, the work does actually continue to have a dialogue with me and with the viewer, hopefully.